Hello everyone, welcome to this tutorial of this simple little pumpkin. This is only going to be about 20 minutes. I've got my size 8 round. I'm going to work on my favorite Stonehenge Aqua Hot Press paper. I'm going to focus on not dabbing colors and mixing them together like a dab of blue, green, yellow next to each other. I'm going to think more in terms of like color block, you know, the color block style of the 80s where you have a big block of red and then a smaller block of blue and a little bit of yellow. I'm going to try to think in terms of that design principle when I'm painting the colors into this pumpkin. And if you look at the pumpkin, it's mostly green on the top and mostly orange on the bottom and yellow in between, which is also pretty, but I want to play a little bit more. And I have no idea what that is on my paper, how very annoying. But anyway, what you see me doing is I'm painting on clean, clear water because I want my paint to go on fairly smoothly. And on hot press, it can get blotchy really fast. So I'm painting on clean, clear water. Before we get too deep into this tutorial, here's a quick word from today's sponsor, my Patreon. Thank you so much to my Patreon students for making my art dreams all come true and making this YouTube channel a possibility. The holidays are right around the corner and my Patreon library is full of beginners to advanced holiday themed tutorials. Join for a year and get two months free. When you join, you'll get access to a full library of tutorials that include line drawings and reference photos. And how many tutorials you are able to access depends on what tier level you choose. I also have a $30 tier level for professionals. So in that tier, I share tutorials about how to paint professional level, gallery level paintings, specifically paintings that I have gotten accepted into national and international shows and have won awards with. So be sure to check out that tier if you're wanting to be a professional. Also, it makes me so happy when students sell an original they made from my tutorial. So let's spread the art love together. I also share experiments, my successes and my failures, and my students quickly realize I am just a regular person like them who has to often try several times to get the results I envision. Most of my tutorials are of looser impressionistic animals painted with advanced wet and wet techniques, although there is plenty for everyone in my tutorial library. When you join for a year, I also offer more in-depth critiques of your paintings and how many depends on what tier level you choose. As my Patreon library grows, my tier prices reflect the added value of both the quantity and quality of my tutorials, so there has never been a better time to join. Visit rachelcu.com slash Patreon index to see all the tutorials I have available. All right, back to our regularly scheduled programming and thank you so much for listening. The other thing that you can't really see what I'm doing is that I'm painting around some spots of dry paper that are in the shape of the contours of the pumpkin right about here to make them look like they have white highlights. So if you leave the paper white uh, and you leave the paper dry, I should say, the paint won't flow into your dry areas unless you paint your brush specifically over those dry areas. So that's the thinking behind getting this wet first, but you need quite a bit of water to paint on your clear water because by the time you get all the water on the other side of the pumpkin, the left side of the pumpkin is going to dry. So just keep that in mind. I think mine dried pretty fast and hot press seems to dry a lot faster than cold press. But that's the idea behind getting everything wet first. It's so that when you float your colors on, it's called charging everything kind of blends together more smoothly and you don't get any blotchiness, which is funny because after I have all my paint on, I'm going to splat at it to give it a lot of texture like a nubbly pumpkin would have. And it's going to be very impressionistic. I'm not going to paint tight or realistic. I'm going to paint super loose and impressionistically for this painting. And the other part that makes this pumpkin really special is the edges that I'm going to do after we get this painted. So you'll see me doing that. But here I'm picking up about Milk Consistency, Daniel Smith Permanent Green Light, and a little bit of Holbein Oriolan. You don't need these exact colors. You just, you can either even mix your own green or use whatever green you have. Sap green plus yellow would be fine. Even phthalo green, if that's what you like to paint with. I hate the phthalos for most applications because they stain and I get them on me. And then I somehow I stamp <laughs> phthalo, the phthalos all over my studio and I just make a 
I'm, I'm such a big awkward cow when it comes to that. So fallow is not my friend. I make a mess with it. So I just keep it away from myself. And the only time I use thallo is when I need good salt effects, like in a winter weather scene or um, really good cauliflowers for winter snow effects. I love it for that. But see, now you can see where I put my um, water because the paint is flowing around it, especially where I got it more wet. And here I'm dotting in a little bit of cobalt just to add a little interest, but it's not really very important. And notice how I'm following the contours of the pumpkin with those highlights. And I'm going to refine them and get them a little bit thinner. You don't want a ton of highlights, just a few. And you can look at your reference photo and just let it inform your decisions about where you put the highlights. I didn't exactly follow my reference, but just roughly. And I'm going to be careful to paint around that stem where it attaches to the rest of the body of the pumpkin. Now I've got a little bit more blue in my mix. So I'm changing my green to a bluer color as we move away from the light. I imagine the light is hitting this pumpkin. Well, it actually is. You can see <laughs> it's hitting it on the left side of the pumpkin. The pumpkins right are left. So it's going to be yellower and lighter over there. And now I'm just putting in really watery um, paint really tea consistency because everything's dried pretty much and um, getting some cobalt getting it pretty thick and I'm gonna get my pumpkin pretty dark and again I'm, I'm fairly uh, closely or loosely following the colors in my pumpkin in my reference so here this, there's this this deep blue green in the pumpkin so I kind of did that and now I'm going to get some yellow and some red for an orange and it's kind of kind of be muddy because it's mixing with the green in my brush I'm okay with that where they kind of transition but then I clean out my brush very carefully uh, wipe it and then pick up some yellow so you want to pick that yellow up with a clean brush not with all that junk we just had in the brush so here's our little yellow color block area. I'm gonna get more pure orange now that I have a clean yellow in my brush. Now I can mix a clean pure orange with that brush because it's got just clean yellow in it. When it had that blue, it made that dirty brown that created mud in my painting, which I didn't mind that. I thought it made it a nice transition. But now I'm painting with pretty much pure orange color, just yellow and red mixed together. So we're keeping this color block. We're about to get a little bold though, because I'm going to drop in some red. You might not want to. That stupid piece. You know what that is, is dried Kuretake white ink. <laughs> That's what that is. All right. There goes that M. Graham naphthol red that we all know and love with its diffusion. It just explodes onto wet paper. That's called diffusion when a paint explodes on paper like that. It's just a gorgeous, fun effect to watch happen. And that M. Graham Napthal Red is the most diffusing paint, one of the most diffusing paints I know. All right, I'm getting more cobalt now, and I'm going to paint the shadow. And you want your shadow to touch the wet paint, and you want them to melt together. And then I get a brush of clean, clear water to soften my shadow. And then I noticed, if you look on the, um, the actual reflection in the real photograph there's green in the reflection it's reflecting the colors of the pumpkin in the in the reflection so i thought that would be or in the shadow i should say it's reflecting the colors of the pumpkin in the shadow so i thought that would be fun to kind of put that in the shadow And see how my pumpkin is melting into the shadow? That's attaching them. All right, I'm letting my paint set up and dry a little bit. If you splat onto super wet paint, you won't get as uh, 
dramatic a splats. So it's good to let your pumpkin to set up like two or three or four minutes, depending on how wet it is, and let it go into buckling. Buckling is when the water kind of absorbs into the paper and makes your paper start to buckle. And that's the time when you can splat and get the most dramatic splat effects. It's all about timing with so many things in watercolor and getting these cauliflower splat textures like a lot of pumpkins have. Um, it just takes patience. And then I'm touching this edge with a uh, brush to soften it. This stem is green, which is interesting. I think of stems as needing to be brown, but I guess I'm a city girl. What do I know? And then I'm just gonna paint the stem. I'm using milk consistency. Just whatever, mix a green that I've already used. The key is to use the same colors you used in the pumpkin so it all kind of ties together. I believe this is my Velvet Touch Long, size four long, which I haven't been using that lately. You can use a six or an eight round, just whatever brush gives you the best control for this size. Mine's about card size. And then I'm getting some junk. For the, this edge, I was using a bit of dry brush there on dry paper with kind of the edge of my brush with a fast, swishy motion. So I got a little bit of dry brush texture. I can't talk all of a sudden. <laughs> dry brush texture in the stem with just some dirty paint uh, for a kind of a brown, a green brown. Because that's kind of what I saw in the reference photo. And then there's darker bits. I'm just going to kind of casually paint in with more cream consistency. The thicker paint you work with, with the less water added, the darker it'll dry. So that's why I call that cream consistency. Cream consistency paint yields the darkest marks and it has the least amount of water. And then of course, what I usually call my tea consistency is a little bit of paint mixed into a lot of water and that dries your that'll make your lightest lights. Milk consistency has a medium amount of water added to the paint. And here I'm just using my tip and really looking at the reference photo this time and really getting these shadows like how I see. This is the shadow of the stem going over the side of the pumpkin. And that shadow defines the 3D contours of this pumpkin tells the story of the pumpkin moving through space. So I wanted to get those right. And then I'm closely looking at my reference photo to understand how the shadows look here, these dark little um, dark details that tell the story of how the pumpkin moves through space. And there's also um, some darker striping and since my paint is wet, I'm being opportunistic. If your paint is not still wet, you won't get soft, dark stripes that are subtle. So that's why it's working for me because my paint is still wet and I'm going in with cream consistency paint to paint in a few contours that are created from the shadows. And I'm not being too uh, persnickety about it. I'm just roughly putting in some um, darker stripes that are there because of the shadows and the pumpkins. And this bled too much on me, so I'm gonna blot that up. I love these little soft, loose edges that I create by touching the wet paint that has set. You don't wanna paint you don't want to do this with freshly painted uh, paint, but when your painting is set up, you can touch the edges like this with water and let it bleed out a little bit, and it'll create a kind of a dreamy bleeding effect. You know, who knew bleeding was so romantic looking? But I just like splats on a painting like this. I just think it looks really good. Some people are pro splat and some people aren't. I'm in the pro camp. You don't want too many that don't overdo it. And let's put some yellow splats here and kind of touch this edge now that it's set up really nicely. It's half dry. So when you touch it with water, it will bleed delicately, but most of the paint will still stay in place 
and you won't lose control of that paint. And that's a great way to get interesting edges. And now everything is dry and I'm going back and just kind of softening a couple edges here with a damp brush. This is a acrylic painting brush that I have a little bit of water in. An acrylic painting brush because it's a little bit stiffer than a watercolor painting brush. So it reactivates the paint and allows you to make these kind of soft edges if you want to. Seeing if I can lift out some highlights there. We can use lifting to lift out highlights. I think this is an adorable card. So let's see what we can do to make it look more finished. Like if we did want to turn this into a card, what would we do? Well, we would fold it like so, right? Again, this is Stonehenge Aqua. And then I think what would be cute, I've got my six round and maybe just paint like a border along here. What about that? So it's just kind of framed in. All right, I'm going to get some about milk consistency cobalt in my six round and I'm going to use it to paint kind of like a frame around my painting because I painted this like a, on a card um, on a piece of paper that I could fold like a card and it really did fold perfectly and this would be so fun to send to a friend or whatever that could use a little cheering up or someone with a birthday or you know someone who would appreciate it but I'm just using the tip and then sometimes I mush it a little bit more so I get a variety of um, widths with my stroke to make it more interesting. And I even break the line. I think that makes it look interesting. I'm just using straight cobalt blue. Almost tea consistency, really. But that just helps frame this pumpkin in for a card. This serves the purpose of what a frame normally does. And here's a picture of a Christmas. Um, here's That was a Christmas card that I did with the most cute. I just love those, the little um, Christmas lights around the border for that cat that I did. No one liked that tutorial, y'all. Hardly anyone watched that tutorial. Why? It's so fun. It's just so cute and easy and fun. But to each their own. <laughs> Nobody watched that hardly. I don't understand, but okay. So there's our card. I'm going to sign mine with a Pigma Micron. This is a zero one size. These are archival ink pens that are perfect for signing with. And I think I'm actually also going to do a little uh, line work just to give this a little bit more definition. And the thing with me with line work, I think it looks better if it's not the same everywhere and you have broken lines and scribbly lines and um, different characteristics in your lines. So you'll see what I mean when I do this. So I put a couple scribbles there, almost like scribbles. And then I skip to another place and just kind of do it really loosely. I just think that looks better. And then put a few little scribbles like it's got um, some threads coming off the top there, the top piece. All right. Thank you so much for watching this short little tutorial. I love these little quick paintings, and I think they're a, a great way to warm up in the morning. So, um, or when before you start painting something more serious, do a little 20 minute warm up like this pumpkin and I've done little trees and a few other little warm up type paintings like this that can help you get warmed up. I think it's perfect and it's also fun and then it gives you a little fun card that you can share with a friend if you want to or whatever you want to use it for a bookmark. That would be cute. I got a little dirty inside but anyway it's really the perfect size to stick in the mail so I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. I will see you in the next one. Now go watercolor your world. Bye, everybody.